Hello again. This Freedom Wins by John Wesley Brady, page 295, in his chapter, Creative Social Service. He's talking about the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, which he says is yet another voluntary organization in the same creative succession. Throughout the country, it has some 300 branches supported by nearly 3,000 ladies' committees and other auxiliary bodies. No district in the kingdom is without a local committee pledged to the guardianship of childhood. This is just before World War II. Then this has all happened in the space of about a hundred years. But as Reverend Benjamin Waugh, its first director, often said, the inspector is the society of these trained and uniformed inspectors who are both men and women. The NSPCC has no less than 270 permanent permanently stationed in allotted areas, with local clergymen, schoolmasters, Sunday school superintendents, magistrates, policemen, and others interested in child welfare, they keep in closest touch. Thus, with the backing of committees, branches, and headquarters, a salutary supervision of child life is always in progress. The purpose of the society is pr protective, not punitive. True, in dire necessity, it does not shirk resort to the courts. But for one case of prosecution, it records several scores of conference, advice, and warning. Education and the sensitizing of conscience are its chief avenues of expression. Not only does it help irresponsible parents to realize their duty towards their offspring, it also helps refractory children to appreciate their duties towards their parents. The child's guardian, the society's official organ, enjoys a circulation above 100,000 copies. Its other publications render high service. Yearly, too, the NSPCC sponsors thousands of public lectures, lantern talks, and films to further the home and community interests of the child. To this society, again, a grateful public annually donates about 150,000 pounds. The British forerunners in this field were Thomas Agnew and Reverend George State, both passionate lovers of children and both religious enthusiasts. By their efforts, a child protection society was founded in Liverpool in 1882. Local enthusiasts in Birmingham and Bristol followed suit. Soon, the Baroness Burdett Coutts and Hesba Stretton, the religious authoress, investigated the Liverpool essay. The upshot was that Mr. Agnew was invited to London to confer with that noble zealot, Benjamin Waugh, a Congregational minister, who, as author of The Jail Cradle, Who Rocks It, jail spelt G-A-O-L in the British manner, the, ga the Jail Cradle, Who Rocks It, as editor of the Sunday magazine and as a member of the London School Board, had wrought conspicuous service to children. They, forthwith, were introduced to Lord Shaftesbury, who advised the f formation of a national society. In deference to the three local societies aforementioned, and mindful of precedence in certain American cities, this advice was not acted upon. But arrangements quickly were made for the establishment of a strong London society. On July 8, 1884, at a packed meeting in the Mansion House, Lord Shaftesbury proposed the resolution which gave birth to that society. Among his supporters, along with Waugh and Agnew, were the Baroness Burdett Coutts, the Earl of Aberdeen, and Dr. Bernardo. These all were avowed evangelicals, but they had sought and won the cooperation of those representing other schools of thought. For instance, the Roman Catholic Cardinal Manning was on the first executive. Inevitably, Shaftesbury was elected president and Waugh honorary secretary. Shaftesbury then was 83, but with but 15 months to live. Waugh was 45 and only approaching the zenith of his powers. With crusading fervor, this parson threw himself into his task. His contagious enthusiasm soon bore fruit. Aid committees sprang into being. In five years, there were 31 laboring in the larger cities of England and Wales. So, in May 1889, this London Society was transformed into the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. 
Wall led it from strength to strength. He, too, belongs to that ageless and saving succession of practical saints to which the modern Pentecost added so valiant a band. Next time, opportunity for the destitute child. I'll put in a link to a video about a fact I did not even realize until I researched this some 20 years ago. There were no schools in ancient Israel, in the Old Testament period anyway. So to whom was education in the Old Testament entrusted? Whose responsibility was education? See you soon.